Hello, I'm Rosie Batty. Tonight's programme is about the mysterious unsolved death of 24-year-old Amy Wensley in 2014. Amy was living on a bush block outside Perth with her family when she died from a gunshot wound. Although police quickly declared her death a suicide, Amy's family disputed the decision and her aunt, Anna, set about investigating. What she found raises serious questions about the nature of Amy's death and police management of the case. Southwest Highway 7 time. Zara Mee Simmons, there's a sign at the gate. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. Somebody shot himself in the head. Are you with that person at the moment? No, I'm not. I've had to drive down to the service station. I have two kids. My wife shot herself. Okay, how old is she? 23. She's dead. So she's not conscious or breathing? Yes, yes. I've got my kids in the car. Can you please come and uh, just take her or do something? Yes, we're going to get that organised. What was your name, sir? David Simmons. David Simmons, okay. Why did she f***ing do that? Amy's case, it's on my mind, and I still think of it today. I can't just drop this. It's too suspicious. There's, there's, um, too many factors that aren't accounted for. That's the sad part about what's happened. The bungle, the police bungle. Everything is sort of blown out the window. I've investigated over uh, a thousand uh, suspicious deaths. I've been involved in over 250 uh, suicides where firearms have been used on numerous occasions looking at the circumstances as to how she's found, the physical uh, part of where she is, I think this is very strange. The fact that it's been written off as a suicide just rang alarm bells. When I looked into it, it just really struck me that there was a fundamental failing here to investigate the, the matter properly. And it left Amy's children and Amy's mother with just no answers. I'm absolutely certain that things would never have got this far without Amy's aunt making noise. She has pushed and pushed and pushed. Twenty sixth of June, two thousand and fourteen. It was a Thursday, winter. It was cold. I'd come home, and um, my phone rang. Nancy, how are you? Nancy, my sister, said to me, Amy's been shot. And all she kept saying to me was, she's gone, Anna, she's gone. Amy's dead, she's gone, she's gone. I felt like throwing that phone so hard against the wall. Nancy said, the police told me Amy killed herself. And I said, what? I said, how do they know that? I said, well, they must have found a suicide note. So where's the, where's the note? And she said, I don't know. It just did not make sense to me. It didn't add up. Oh, show me how you do jumping on your trampoline, your new trampoline, show mum. Oh, wow. <laughs> Amy lived for her girls and loved them so much. So to think that Amy would do that and to take herself away from her babies is just unbelievable. You know, why would Amy tell my mum she's on her way and then go back inside and shoot herself in the head? It just made no sense. Do you want to find Amy or what? I wanted to know how it happened, why it happened. <gasps> Did you get that? <laughs> I just couldn't believe it. She put it in there. <laughs> it just didn't sound like Amy. Hey, that's Come here. So why, until they were sure that it wasn't 100% suicide, why wasn't it a homicide investigation? The day after Amy died, there was a news story 
about Amy and the possible homicide because the way that she died was so violent, it concerned the police. Major crime detectives came out and they were looking at it and they were working on it. But the night before Amy's funeral, they said they had finished their investigation and their conclusion is that Amy killed herself. We were not going to let it go. And my mum was too fragile to do anything herself. And she was too focused on looking after Amy's two girls. So my auntie proceeded to make phone calls and send emails and do her own investigation rather than the police doing their job properly. It was my auntie doing their job. At that point, Amy's case was with the coroner's office. But my family and I felt that there were things that weren't explained in a lot of detail to us. I suspected that Amy did not take her life. I suspected that um, there was someone involved. There's definitely things that people need to hear about who Amy was. And that's what I've written about. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of Amy's close friends, one being Amy's best friend, Erin, had not been interviewed by police. And at that point, that really concerned me, um, that no one had spoken to them um, to discover background information. I thought, well, hang on, you know, here we are, 2014. If I don't capture this moment now, while it's fresh in their mind, it could be things that are lost. So I asked them if they would write a statement for me. And it says that when she met her partner, her life, look, personality and outlook on life changed. Mm. So how do you go from that to that so quickly, you know? Yeah. This makes me remember being on the phone to her and then the conversation would just change. She would just start talking about something else randomly and then I'd realise, oh, he's home now so she can't can't vent anymore or talk about what she was talking about. I met Amy at high school. Amy was always smiling, laughing. She just loved being around people. She had so many friends. She was just a really gentle soul and yeah, she was just a great kid. Never a problem. Hi, Nanny and Poppy. This is Amy, and I'm in now. I had a very strong bond with Amy. I'm recording. Being there when she was born, being her aunt, and being her godmother was just all rolled into this really special thing for me. Just a very, very special bond. Amy's father wasn't around for a lot of Amy's childhood, so she didn't have that father figure in her life. And I guess that maybe one of the reasons why Amy had children so young was she was looking for her own family unit. Amy was 18 when she had her first child. Loved being a mum. The relationship with her uh, first partner didn't turn out how she would have hoped. So she left that relationship. She was by herself for a little while, and it wasn't long until she met her partner. She met David mid to early 2009. Met him when she was working at the pub. She had told me about this guy that was coming in and drinking with his friends and talking to her and she was a bit smitten and I could tell like she was like he was hot and everything. He was nice, like yeah, he was nice. He was saying all the right things, he was treating her well, like when you'd go there he'd be talking to her and flirting away. She seemed happy and that's sort of how it all began. She liked the witty side of him. David had sort of a charm that he could switch on, take her emotions away and sweep her off her feet. David was working with his dad. He was driving trucks and doing some labour jobs here and there. 
When David wasn't working, he would like to go out bush. They would take their dogs out, do camping and all that sort of thing. No, stay very still, all right? Oh. Hey, tell him I'm a lover, my God. Oh, my God. He was very social. He wanted to go out. He wanted to be with the boys. He was a country boy and Amy was not a country girl. <laughs> David likes pigging and, you know, shooting and guns and all these different types of things that you just wouldn't associate with Amy. Amy just would have found a common ground with him, just got into it as well. Good news. In the process of getting my firearm licence. Passed the test the other day. She had a pink gun. Very Amy. Very Amy to have a pink gun, even though a gun. In late June 2010, she was heavily pregnant. It was a very fast transition from new relationship to being pregnant and expecting a baby. The picture I got from Tash was that after Amy fell pregnant, things began to change. She told me what she saw before Amy gave birth to David's child, and it was extremely concerning. I went to Amy's house after work on the Friday, pretty much to stay for the weekend, because she said David was going out that night. And then he didn't end up coming home, and it wasn't until later that Saturday that he came home and she was just absolutely livid, being nine months pregnant, about to give birth. So they started fighting. And as I walked back through, they were in the kitchen, and I just remember seeing him with his hands around her neck bent over the kitchen table. And Amy, she was fighting back. It was just intense. I never thought I'd see that. Like, she's nine months pregnant. So I ended up having to push them apart. And then by the end of the night, they were OK but it shocked me, and to actually see it, it was heartbreaking. I started to transition into this really tense relationship. It was a lot of non-trust. When we go out, if anyone spoke to her as in male attention, then he would pretty much call her a slut. I've heard him call her a slut and belittle her and make it a big issue when it was not an issue at all. The night would then end. Amy, she just stopped drinking because it wasn't worth the arguments and the fights. She started toning everything down. She wasn't as social, didn't dress up as much. It was like her personality was being dimmed like a light switch, just slowly turned off. Get off YouTube if you take that. <laughs> I remember one day we were sitting in Amy's lounge room and Amy was quite small. And I remember him grabbing her on the back of the neck and bending her forward. So her head was down sort of in between her knees. And to save face, Amy would laugh it off as, as playful, but if it was playful, you wouldn't have, he wouldn't have kept going because she was obviously in pain. David rocks up at 4.30 a.m., jumps in bed and I ask, well, what's wrong? He replies, yeah, I had a few chokes of crack. I see red and start punching into him. He then manhandles me, choking me, chucking me around the room. My adrenaline is pumping, I don't feel a thing. I never saw any physical abuse, just like the verbal. I said to Amy, you know, why put up with that crap? Leave him. 
but for some reason Amy would always took him back and I don't know why he had a hold over Amy. She did love him. I know she told me that. She told me that she could not have another breakdown in family unit like she did with the first father. She said she didn't want to have babies to multiple different dads. She wanted this relationship to work and she would try anything to make it work. <laughs> By the beginning of 2014, Amy and her children had moved with David onto a property belonging to his father, Robert. Robert actually lived on the, on the property as well. He was up in a main house, and the house that David and Amy and the children were living in was 600 metres down the driveway. There was nothing there, and she was upset about it. She didn't want to move. She's isolated, she's stuck. Amy was involved in a car accident in 2013 in which she suffered two fractured vertebrae. After the vehicle accident, Amy went on antidepressants. But that's not to say that she was suicidal or anything like that, and there was no mention of that in medical records with her doctors where she discussed any suicidal thoughts. By the time I was a few months into investigating, I'd come to realise how toxic this relationship was. There was a lot of emotional extremes involved. And you have to remember, Amy was only a young woman in her early 20s, um, dealing with all of this as a young mother with two children and trying to navigate through this, this messy relationship. Then I heard about another friend named Shelley, who was a little bit older than Amy. What she had to tell me was just as troubling as what Amy's other friends had told me. Hello. Hi, Shelley. It's Anna. How are you? Oh, good, thank you. How are you? I'm good. Shelley, I'm trying to piece together what happened, what led to it, and what people know. Did you, did you approach the police? I rang through to Crime Stoppers. It would have been in the first week after Amy passed away because I thought it was really important. A lady police officer did call me back. I explained to her that I had text messages from Amy implying that she was in an abusive relationship but also talking about um, Dave's alcohol and drug use. I remember her, her words were something along the lines of, I'll pass it all on to the investigating detectives. So they didn't think it was important enough? So no, at the, at the time, I didn't get a call back. I thought that the information I had and, and the text messages I had were worth um, looking into. I guess I was shocked that they weren't in investigating it as a potential murder. It's my old phone from um, back when Amy was alive. So it's got all my text messages on um, from Amy. Hi, Shelley. Oh, my God. Dave has been excessively drinking and is always drunk. And I'm over babying him after his big nights. Then on Friday, he got on the drugs, which I'm totally against. I've left him in the past because he got on the crack and I just exploded. Don't know what to do because if I stay and he says he'll change in another six months time, he'll go back to the same shit. Amy and David had the kind of relationship that had really big ups and really low downs. It was constantly a roller coaster. You never knew where they were going to be tomorrow, what the feelings were going to be like. Every time I spoke to Amy, there was sort of something different happening. Should we send this to Dad? Yes. OK. What do you want to say to Dad? We love you, Dad. Love you, Dad. Go sing. Both Amy and Dave had spoken about breaking up at different times. Go sing. Ever, ever, ever. 
sometimes Dave had asked her to go to her mum's, said he needed space. Oh, 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 oh. She had told me she gave him an ultimatum and that she couldn't continue if he continued with the drugs and the alcohol. My last conversation with Amy, she was so excited. She'd started looking at rentals. She had a plan that she was going to go do part-time work at a cafe. When I saw her at a birthday party two weeks before her death, she was determined. She was sad that it, it hadn't really worked out, but she knew that she had to do that for her girls and for, for herself. I was quite worried for her, knowing that it's a dangerous time for, for women to leave someone. A week before Amy died, she disclosed to her stepfather, Rick, that she had an argument with um, David Simmons and he had held a knife to her throat. So it was never really clear to me what was going through Amy's mind the days before she passed away because there was light-hearted chat between her and David in text messages about wedding rings, which we never understood. This is their relationship. It's so up and down, and like I say, it's volatile. When they're good, they were good. When they're bad, they were bad. They might have been good for that moment. They might have been fine. Those last few weeks, she came over to my house. We spoke every day. And she was just her normal self. The picture I got of Amy's last day of life after reading reports and statements was that Amy spent the morning with a friend, Rachel. They went shopping together in the morning and they went back to Amy's place with the children. David was with two of his friends, Joshua Bryden and Gareth Price, and they were out chopping wood or hunting or whatever they do out in the bush. Amy couldn't contact David because his phone had become damaged, so she was using Facebook Messenger to send messages through Joshua Bryden. She seems in a calm mood. And then at some point, Rachel and her child went home. For me, reading between the lines, it sounded like Amy was frustrated with David, um, disappointed in him. He had an appointment that day at the property and he wasn't home for it and she was very concerned. The boys had been out hunting, drinking. I believe Dave had organised for someone to come and buy firewood and she'd been trying to contact them and they hadn't responded. I'm guessing she would have been very angry that he didn't show up at the time that he had said. At some point, Amy's gone to pick her eldest daughter up from school. And something's happened when she got home. Children describe their mother as being upset. A fight has happened. David Simmons, Gareth Price, and Joshua Bryden were all there. The arguing apparently has started between Amy and David. According to the three men that were present that night, Amy was furious with David and attacked him and then tried to hit him with a mirror. He restrained her 
And after that happened, she got up and she went out to a shed and pushed over a glass tank. Not long after the tank was smashed, Joshua Bryden left the property. At about 5 p.m., she spoke to her mother on the phone. I got home from work and I rung her. And when she answered the phone, I've never, never heard her cry like that. Never in my life. I said to her, what's happened? Straight away, she said, I can hate him. Amy had told her mother that she had a fight with David and that she had thrown a beer bottle at him and I believe punched him in the lip. She said that David had grabbed her by the throat and slammed her to the floor, which made Nancy extremely angry because Amy was recovering from two fractured vertebrae. Told her, how could she get the girls? Come and stay with me. I said, I'll come pick you and the girls up. And she said, no, mum, I'll be there soon. And that's when she started calming down. She wasn't hysterical. By the end of the phone call, Amy was calm and she's leaving and she's going to her mother's house. But at 5.18, Gareth Price and David Simmons, with the children in the back seat, driving Amy's car, have driven to a roadhouse to make a triple zero call to say that Amy had shot herself. Within the 18 minutes, something has gone terribly wrong. And that's where the issue is. She's dead. It's what happened. Ambulance, tell me exactly what happened. I have two kids. My wife shot herself. Can you please come and uh, just take her or do something? Yes, we're going to get that organised. I tried to call her a bit after 5.30 and just kept ringing and ringing and no one answering. And I was sort of panicking, thinking, what do I do? If I go there, am I going to make things worse? And then when I heard Amy's car pull up, I thought, oh, yeah, they're here now. The girls were there, but not Amy. She just... She didn't come. Yeah, I was on a afternoon shift and we were just getting our gear ready to, to go on, on patrols. Our emergency call came through June 26, 2014. It was a uh, fatal shooting of a female. So we didn't know any of, the, uh, any of the circumstances. So all three officers were jumping into the motor vehicle and we headed out to that address. Gareth Price was uh, sitting on the fence. And uh, he advised me that his mate's partner had committed suicide. Councillor Dixon and I went into the house. And uh, that's where uh, I located Amy in her bedroom behind the door. I sort of had doubts straight away as soon as I saw the body the gun, the positioning. Um, I was I, I was alerted to the fact that um, you know we had to uh, look into this further. It was a fatal headshot, and uh, definitely suspicious. David Simmons, the partner of Amy, was was not on site. He'd left with Amy's car and the two kids. When I opened the front door, David was there. That's when David told me that Amy was dead. The hardest thing was telling her daughters that Mum's not coming home. <laughs> It 
took me a while to actually go into Amy's car because I just couldn't bring myself to do it. And then when I finally did, it was just chucked in, like someone's just grabbed a whole heap of clothes and just thrown it all into the boot of the car. Her clothes, her makeup, her jewellery, her shoes. Her youngest daughter was turning four in two days' time, and she's packed the birthday presents for her younger daughter. She's packed her passport. She's going. She's leaving. If someone was going to commit suicide, they wouldn't have grabbed their things like that and thrown them all in the boot. My understanding is the following morning, the police chaplain should have turned up to see Nancy. But coincidentally, it was the two women from the Family Protection Unit who went out to see her. I told them about the phone call, what Amy said, what I said, and about the suitcase. They were so alarmed by what Nancy had said that they had gone back to the police station and pretty much raised the alarm. Shortly after, David Simmons and Gareth Price were both arrested by the police. David was arrested on suspicion of murder and Gareth was arrested on suspicion of being an accessory after the fact. That's due to both of them being present on the property when Amy died. But they were released without charge and the police declared Amy's death a suicide. After the funeral, the two ladies from the Family Protection Unit came up to me and they said to me, you need to talk to your sister and tell her to keep fighting. And I said, oh, what? I said, oh, haven't you heard? I said, major crime came over last night and they told us that Amy did it. That's their conclusion. And she said, we're mothers and if this was us, we'd keep fighting. And I knew, I just knew that 100% they were right. It's like pressing a go button. on the night didn't even speak to one member of my family, not one. The detectives seem to have rushed to the conclusion that it was a suicide. Once you clean that scene up, you can't go back. The firearm wasn't treated for forensics. All this evidence is, is now gone. I thought, well, this is a real schmozzle, what's happening here? Three years after Amy died, we finally got some encouraging news. Professor Ackland was asked to prepare a full biomechanical report and he tried to do some reconstructions using a uh, similarly sized uh, police officer to Amy. This is a, a long process of testing against multiple scenarios about how Amy could self-inflict that fatal gunshot injury. Cold case were able to get into Amy's phone. She's holding her mobile phone to take a photo of her reflection in the mirror. She's actually holding the gun that ended her life. Now, she's taken that selfie at 10 to 5. At 5 o'clock, she spoke to her mother. 18 minutes later, she's dead. Why did she take that photo? Looks like she took it for a reason. The feeling I got was that the police were concerned that perhaps this photo indicates that Amy harmed herself. David Simmons and Gareth Price gave evidence at the inquest that they were outside at the time of the noise that ultimately appears to have been Amy being shot. I can't read the crystal ball and say, Amy did shoot herself, Amy didn't shoot herself. It's frustrating to think on the night the investigation of homicide hasn't been carried out. 